Smile Though your heart is aching Smile even though it's breaking When there are clouds In the sky You'll get by If you smile through your fear and sorrow Smile and maybe tomorrow You'll see the sun come shining through For you Light up your face with gladness Hide every trace of sadness Although a tear may be ever so near That's the time you must keep on trying Smile, what's the use of crying? You'll find that life is still worthwhile If you just smile the time you must keep on trying smile what's the use of crying you'll find that life is still worthwhile if you just
listen, this is the third annual John Warwick Montgomery Lecture in Evidential Apologetics. Now, in 2021, the man himself, John W. Montgomery, was here to talk about, this was his title, well, roughly his topic, not his title, how is it that unbelievers persist in unbelief despite the clear evidences of the Christian faith? And last year, Mark Lanier himself spoke from his book, Atheism on Trial. And this time, John Lennox from Oxford University is here to speak about 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. I am so pleased about that. Now, inside of your uh, program is a brochure that tells a little bit about an academic academy on apologetics that takes place annually in Strasbourg. Now, it's amazing. We would encourage you to look and read more about that while you're here. Would you thank John Lennox for being here all the way from Oxford and give him a warm Texas welcome. Are you sitting comfortably, ladies and gentlemen? Well, so am I. I learned to do this in Siberia, and then I discovered it was totally biblical. Rabbis sit to teach. And I'm so thrilled at this late stage of my life to have been allowed to come into contact with the Lanier Foundation. And it's a real high point for me to be invited to come amongst you to this facility which has enormous potential for reaching the world for Christ. The initiatives are mind-blowing, but they're real. And I believe they're going to have a wonderful future. And it's been an honor for me to get to know the senior people, Mark and his wife, the two Davids, and they have welcomed me with a warmth that I think is really characteristic of this part of the world. And I should probably say to you, how are y'all? <laughs> now, I see that I'm not like the bishop, an elderly bishop, who turned up at a little country church in the depths of the Cotswolds in England, near where I live, on a Sunday to preach. And as he mounted the pulpit stairs, he noticed that there were only three elderly people in the congregation. And because he was like me, frail, he was being helped up to the pulpit. And as he ascended, he said to the local minister, did you tell them I was coming? And the minister said, no, but word seems to have got around. <laughs> Now, you have asked me to speak on a hugely important topic, and I'm going to try my best to introduce it to you in the context of deep concern on the part of many leading thinkers. E.O. Wilson is a brilliant American entomologist, and he said that the real problem of humanity is the following. We have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology, and it's terrifically dangerous. Until we answer those huge questions of philosophy that the philosophers abandoned a couple of generations ago, where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? Rationally, we're on very thin ground. I disagree with them about the philosophers. We are fortunate, I think, in the Christian world to have some distinguished philosophers, some in this room tonight, who have not abandoned these big questions, which are the famous three questions of Immanuel Kant. We have ways of dealing with this fundamental set of problems, even though they are terrifically dangerous. And one brilliant way of formulating those answers was given by the late Lord Jonathan Sachs, the ch chief rabbi of the United Kingdom. Science, he said, takes things apart to see how they work. 
religion puts them together to see what they mean. And tragically, the emphasis over the centuries on the natural sciences and their domination, and I'm a scientist and I love science, has, as the recent writer, neuroscientist, polymath, Ian McGilchrist has said, it's left us in a world where we understand how almost everything works and we know the meaning of nothing. And so he's written a book called The Matter with Things. But what are these scary things? Well, they're not just the product of overheated imagination of science fiction writers. They are coming from some of the most distinguished minds in our generation, like, for example, our astronomer royal, Lord Martin Rees. Talking about our topic, he says, the abstract thinking by biological brains has underpinned the emergence of all culture and science, but this activity, spanning tens of millennia at most, will be a brief precursor to the more powerful intellects of the inorganic post-human era. So, in the far future, it won't be the minds of humans, but those of machines, that will most fully understand the cosmos. Now, of course, we are all familiar with two famous books, dystopias written about the future, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World and George Orwell's 1984. And my title, 2084, was given to me by a very famous atheist in Oxford, who when he discovered I was writing on artificial intelligence, he said, I've got a title for you. And he said, you should call it 2084. So I said, if I do, I'll acknowledge you. And I did. Neil Postman, in a fascinating book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, wrote some time ago, contrasting these two analyses of the future. Orwell, he said, warns that we will be overcome by an externally imposed oppression, Big Brother. But in Huxley's vision, no Big Brother is required to deprive people of their autonomy, maturity, and history. People will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. So Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. And in our current culture, it seems to me that both things are happening simultaneously. We have a love-hate relationship with what is going on. Now, the response to the technologically driven oppression in terms of surveillance Reactions are very different. Uh, some people think, and here's an example, a very famous web engine developer, and he said that AI doesn't mean that the end of humanity is nigh. It's maths, code, computers, built by people, owned by people, controlled by people. The idea that it will, at some point, develop a mind of its own and decide that it is motivations that lead it to try to kill us is a superstition a superstitious hand wave. In short, AI doesn't want, it doesn't have goals, it doesn't want to kill you because it's not alive. AI is a machine, and it's not going to come alive any more than your toaster. <laughs> Mind you, when my toaster this morning threw two bits of toast up two feet in the air, I thought maybe it was coming alive. <laughs> so that's one view. But here's a different view by a man who's known as the godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, who left Google recently to be free to speak about what he saw as the dangers of it. So here's what he says, but as soon as it gets really complicated, we don't actually know what's going on any more than we know what's going on in your brain. We designed the learning algorithm. But when this learning algorithm then interacts with data, 
It produces complicated neural networks that are good at doing things, but we don't, here it comes for the second time, we don't really understand exactly how they do those things. One of the ways in which these systems might escape control is by writing their own computer code to modify themselves. And that's something we need to seriously worry about. So that puts forward a picture, some of it optimistic, some of it pessimistic of the future. But what are we talking about? We're talking about artificial intelligence. But what is it? And it comes in two sorts, as many of you will know. There's narrow AI, and a narrow AI system typically does one thing and one thing only that normally requires an intelligent human being. Radiology gives us a very good example. An AI system for analyzing chest X-ray images it uses an algorithm. That's just simply a set of step-by-step -step instructions embedded in computer software that selects a fit for my X-ray of my lungs from a huge database of X-rays of other people that are labeled by doctors with the diseases that they represent. And it then gives the diagnosis. And that diagnosis these days will normally be better than what your local hospital can give you. There's been a recent phenomenal development in adaptive radiotherapy for tumors. Artificial intelligence reduces two weeks' work to five minutes. And that kind of advance is spectacularly beneficial to human beings. Now, what we're going to find is this, that like any technology, AI is like a sharp knife. A sharp knife can be used to do surgery. It can be used to commit murder. And the more advanced the technology, the more it can be used for good and the more it can be used for evil. So let's just have a look, run through briefly some current examples of narrow AI. Digital assistance, Siri, Alexa, and so on. Online shopping, I buy a book. A few minutes later, a pop-up tells me that people who bought my book often bought the other book. Then uh, there's the phenomenal research conducted by people like Demas Hassabis, one of the geniuses of the AI world, who solved a problem that was thought to be completely intractable, and that is how do proteins fold, and to make new molecules and to use them for the development of medicine and so on. Then AI is used for job interviews or non-interviews, where people never come face to face with an individual, but an artificial intelligence poses questions to them and decides whether they're suitable for the job. And of course, now the dangers start because bias is built in. The programs are made by humans and humans are biased and some of these Interviewing programs have been seen to be biased against women, for example, against people of color, and so on and so forth. And there's a whole industry out there trying to deal with the increasingly intransigent problem of the ethics of artificial intelligence. Because the one thing that's obvious is this. The technology is rising at a vast pace, and the ethics is chugging along very far behind. Then there's crime prevention. Uh, and this brings me again to the kind of face recognition technology, which is incredibly sophisticated. It's no longer face recognition. The Chinese have developed cameras that can recognize you by your gait from any direction, the back, the front, anything. And of course, police forces love to have this to pick out a terrorist in a crowd. But the flip side of it is there's an entire population in Xinjiang in China that is being monitored unbelievably and is being oppressed and suppressed by being subject to the most intrusive and constant surveillance. 
And now comes the huge problem. You want to be secure. We all want to be secure. How much of your privacy are you prepared to give up to be secure? And that's a very difficult problem to decide. So these technologies are being used, particularly in Xinjiang, to control a population and, in fact, to remove its ethnic roots and re-educate it. But as a famous article in this warned, all the technology that can do this is available in the West. And the writer pointed out the only difference is it is not yet in the West under the control of a single authoritarian central authority. Then we've got chat GPT. Now, these are all just narrow AI. All of this stuff is working. It's in operation today. Chat GPT, as you know, is a very advanced version of the thing that used to drive me mad. My first simple, smart-ish phone kept telling me what I should write next. Do you remember those phones? And they drove you absolutely out of your mind. But now Chat GPT, you can write into it and type a question and ask it, what does Mark Lanier think of atheism? And it's read all his books, but it didn't get permission for, from you for copyright, did it? And uh, as many of you know, there's a big class action being undertaken. It's read my books. I checked that up, some of them. It has given up, I think. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there are all those problems. And it's interesting because it's useful. I know many people that are using it to do research, to find out things, to have stuff to investigate. But all of them tell me it is very important to check out what you find. Very interesting thing recently, ChatGPT was asked a series of very penetrating questions. Are you an atheist? And after a whole sequence of questions, it came to the end and it says, I'm an atheist. But the next question was, are you a Christian? And these penetrating questions went all the way through and it ended up by saying, you may say, I am a Christian. So it's both a Christian and an atheist at the same time, apparently. There are huge dangers with this. And there's a very big debate among school teachers. I was in a seminar for directors of higher educational institutions. Half of them wanted it used. Half of them wanted it banned. And people are working, and I know in this country especially, as to how far you can let it go. Should we have all examinations in Faraday cages so that there's no electronic signal can come in or out? I tend to um, agree with that kind of approach to it. We need to test what people think. Then there are deep fakes, and this is now getting into really serious territory. A short video clip of you, a short audio clip, and they can make you say anything they want you to say. And the deep fake technology is already to such an extent that you might get a phone call. I wonder if any of you have. It sounds like your daughter, and she's stuck in Paris, and she needs an air ticket, and it's on sale right at the moment, and please, Dad, send me $1,000 at once. What father who had $1,000 would reject that? But it's not his daughter. It's a clone of the voice by a deep fake, and it could be on video. So many families are adopting the very sensible technique that if any putative family member telephones them to talk about finance, they've got code words and code questions so that they can be sure they're talking to their children. And then there are, of course, autonomous vehicles, autonomous weapons. AI war is already being fought by the control of swarms of drones that are equipped with lethal weapons. And that raises all kinds of questions. So all of these are technologies that are being developed at a huge speed, and they're all in operation today. But artificial intelligence is not intelligent. The word artificial is there for a reason. It simulates intelligence. In other words, it plays what's called the imitation game, which is the name of a very interesting film about the late Alan Turing, 
who invented the enig uh, who solved the problem of the German Enigma machine and invented the bomb, B O M B E. And it's important to realize, and we're coming closer to a very big question what is a human being? Because that's being questioned left, right, and center today. We notice that God has coupled in human beings intelligence with consciousness. Now, no one, and I've talked to some of the world's leading researchers, no one knows what consciousness is. And when people say that machines are conscious, they're actually talking nonsense. They don't even know what consciousness is. And many leading researchers are perfectly content to simulate intelligence without consciousness. In other words, that X-ray AI machine, the result looks as if it had been reached by a conscious, intelligent human being. But it's been reached by a machine which is neither intelligent nor conscious. It's simply doing what it's been programmed to do. And here Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig, authors of the, what's regarded by many people as the AI Bible, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, third edition, we are interested in creating programs that behave intelligently. The additional project of making them conscious is not one that we are equipped to take on, nor one whose success we would be able to determine. So that's a very honest statement by two of the pioneers in these fields. All of that narrow AI, one thing that normally requires an intelligent human. But there's a second quest, and that's the quest for artificial general intelligence. And as the name suggests, the idea is to create technology that can simulate everything and a great deal more that normally takes an intelligent human being. And there are two directions of research. In order to build a super intelligent AI system that equals or exceeds all human capacities, you either take existing humans and enhance them by bioengineering, or you start with a non-biological base. One of the problems of getting old is that our bodies, the bits start to fall off it, as I know, and the bones start to creak, and all of that. Wouldn't it be great to do without the biological stuff and just have the hard silicon uh, mechanical stuff? Well, that's one way people want to go. Now, because it is futuristic, and it appeals to the imagination, there is a lot of literature about it. And in my book, I interact with various kinds of literature at a scientific and popular level, as well as the literature in the subject itself. But one of the most influential writers these days is Yuval Noah Harari. He's not a scientist. He is an Israeli historian. And he's written a book, A Brief History of Tomorrow, Homo Deus, which being translated from Latin is the God-man, the man who is God. And the reason he's called his book that is he believes that this century, the 21st century, is going to see two major developments. First of all, there's going to be a serious bid for immortality, by which he means we are going to solve the medical problem of physical death. For him, death is a technological problem. And he writes that technological problems always have technological solutions. So we shall solve the problem of physical death, which won't mean that people may not die. It will mean they don't have to die. And so you have people hoping that this will be solved, freezing their brains and their bodies, uh, and hoping that one day they'll be wakened up if nobody switches the power off in the meantime that's keeping them cold. The second agenda item is intensification of the pursuit of happiness, 
making us happier people. Uh, now here's what needs to be done according to Harari. It will be necessary to change our biochemistry and re-engineer our bodies and our minds so that we shall need to re-engineer Homo sapiens so that it can enjoy everlasting pleasure. Now listen to this very carefully. Having raised humanity above the beastly level of survival struggles, we will now aim to upgrade humans into gods and turn Homo sapiens into Homo Deus. And he adds, now humankind is poised to replace natural selection with intelligent design and extend life from the organic realm into the inorganic. He's got many people on his side. There's a lot of money being put into it. And I would repeat, this is not simply the pipe dream of an obscure historian. There are many leading scientists like Lord Rees that feel that this will be achieved. Now, moving humankind beyond human means that they're going to become what's called transhuman. Now that's a serious issue. God created human beings model 101 in his own image. Now, says Harari, that's only one stage. It parallels in our society what's going on with gender. God created male and female. But now we're moving on from that. And it's all becoming fluid. Exactly the same at a much higher level is happening with human beings themselves. So what is transhumanism? A lot of it comes from my own university, I regret to say. The intellectual, and this is Nick Bostrom of the Oxford Institute for the Future, the intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally improving the human condition through applied reason, especially by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging and to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. That's transhumanism. So we're going to enhance human beings, we're going to eliminate aging, and we're going to become essentially supermen and women with bigger brains, more ability, and all the rest of it. But now there's been a subtle change. Transhumanism will produce, in some people's opinion, billions of entities. Let's not call them human, because they won't be human. They'll be transhuman. They may be cyborgs. A cyborg is a combination of the biological and the mechanical in many science fiction novels. And in the future, Lord Rees says that the majority of the population is going to be those entities. So what should our attitude be today? And here we come to the fearful term, and I say that advisedly, of long-termism. Listen carefully to Bostrom's priorities. Priority number one, two, three, and four should be to reduce existential risk we mustn't fritter away our finite resources on feel-good projects of suboptimal efficacy, such as alleviating global poverty and reducing animal suffering, since neither threatens our long-term potential and our long-term potential is what really matters. That's devastating because it's a complete denial of the fundamental altruistic moral principle, love your neighbor as yourself. Don't bother about the two-thirds world, but pour your money into the brains in the West who are going to be able to develop these beings because if you don't pour the money there, 
you run the risk of these beings never being created. Now, apparently, and I have this from several good sources, it's not millions but billions of dollars that are going into these projects. We've got to think very hard, ladies and gentlemen, don't we? As to how we're going to respond to this, because this is totally not amoral, but immoral. And Joshua Bendigo, who is a, a very famous fellow of the Royal Society, Canadian computer scientist, neural networks, deep learning, he was right in at the heart of it. And he says this, people need to understand that current AI and the AI we can foresee in the reasonable future does not and will not have a moral sense or moral understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Not only that, there's the question of truth. Ken McCallum, head of MI5 in the UK, was in California three days ago. And this was published two days ago in the London Times. The fabric of society, he says, could be undermined by AIs impersonating real people. That's the deep fake. So that it would no longer be possible to distinguish truth from falsehood. Deep fake technology is a threat to democracy and could be harnessed by hostile states to sow confusion and disinformation at the next general election in any country. Governments are scared. There are big meetings about this. What is going to happen to the democratic electoral process? Now, one commentator on all these things who I love to read is Leon Cass of Chicago. He's a polymath, he's Jewish, and he's written some phenomenally interesting commentaries on Genesis and Exodus from a philosophical perspective, but here's what he says. We have paid some high prices for the technological conquest of nature, but none so high as the intellectual and spiritual costs of seeing nature as mere material for our manipulation, exploitation, and transformation. With the powers of biological engineering gathering, there will be splendid new opportunities for similar degradation of our view of man. If we come to see ourselves as meat, then meat we shall become. And C.S. Lewis saw it in the 1940s. The first edition of this book is in the library behind me. Man's conquest of nature means the rule of a few hundreds of men over billions upon billions of men. Each new power one by man is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. In every victory, besides being the general who triumphs, he is also the prisoner who follows the triumphal car. Man's final conquest has proved to be the abolition of man. 1940s, he saw it, and it's coming true. So AI, to many people, is posing a major threat or perhaps three threats. First of all, take over an AI war to end all wars. Secondly, mass unemployment. Not only will be people unemployed, they'll be unemployable because they haven't got the skills to cope with this. That's a huge problem. In sub-Saharan Africa, I was talking at a seminar there, and they said to me, it's all very well telling us to reskill and learn to use artificial intelligence, but we don't have the educational infrastructure to do that. And the bias that we talked about before. The late Stephen Hawking was always interesting to read, and he made a comment on what's called the alignment problem. Thinking of this first thing, the takeover by AI. The real risk with AI, he wrote, isn't malice, but competence. A super intelligent AI will be extremely good at accomplishing its goals, and if those goals aren't aligned with ours, we're in trouble. So you've got the alignment problem that leads to the regulation problem. Regulation will be critical, says Sam Altman, the head of OpenAI that developed ChatGPT. It will take time to figure out, although current generation AI tools aren't very scary, I think we're potentially not that far away 
from potentially scary ones. But you know, in most of the Western countries, at least before 2020, there was no ethical policy for dealing with this kind of thing whatsoever. Stuart Russell, whom I quoted earlier, one of the pioneers, he uh, puts up three principles that he feels governments ought to adhere to. Firstly, restrict an AI system's goals only to maximizing the realization of human goals. Then keep the AI uncertain about what those goals are so that it has to keep asking. And thirdly, insist that it tries to understand the nature of those goals by constant observation of human behavior. How realizable these things are is another huge question. And it leads to very deep ethical problems that you can ask me about later. Now, with all that, people think about possible scenarios as Orwell and Huxley did. And one of the prominent thinkers about this is a brilliant physicist, uh, Max Tegmark of Princeton. And he's got several, about a dozen, AI scenarios that he sets up in his book Life 3.0. I'm only going to mention three of them. The first one is that AI is developed and it becomes a kind of protector god. These are his words. It's amazing the number of times God appears in these books. So essentially omniscient and omnipotent, AI maximizes human happiness by intervening only in ways that preserve our feeling of control of our own destiny and hides well enough that many humans even doubt the AI's existence. Opposite to that, AI takes control. It decides that humans are a threat, nuisance or waste of resources, and gets rid of them by a method they don't understand, and possibly even keeps a few as pets in a little zoo. But what's interesting about his book is he gives a lot of space to what he calls the Omega Project. This he develops in detail. It comes out of the Turkers in Amazon, and this Omega corporation becomes a world corporation and gathers all the wealth and he describes it in great detail until he reaches the climax of it. For the first time ever, our planet was run by a single power called Prometheus, amplified by an intelligence so vast that it could potentially enable life to flourish for billions of years throughout the cosmos. But what specifically was their plan? And one of the major characteristics of Prometheus was this economic control. With the excuse of fighting crime and terrorism and rescuing people suffering medical emergencies, everybody could be required to wear a security bracelet that combined the functionality of an Apple Watch with continuous uploading of position, health status, and conversations overheard. Unauthorized attempts to remove or disable it would cause it to inject a lethal toxin into the forearm. That is the scenario that he spends most time over. Now, let's bring another realm, and that is the question of a new AI religion. Now, the person writing these words is the director for the Center for Professional and Applied Ethics at Montreal University. We're about to witness the birth of a new kind of religion. In the next few years, or perhaps even months, we will see the emergence of sects devoted to the worship of artificial intelligence. It has already started, ladies and gentlemen. And why is that? Well, it's obvious. Certain AI systems are beginning to exhibit the kind of capacities usually ascribed to deity, such as immortality, omniscience, and omnipresence. These super AIs have prayer-like connectivity via the internet, the oracle-like capacity of chat GPT to answer virtually any question, produce life advice, and even scriptures almost instantaneously. Nor do they have needs or desires like humans, only electricity. You can see it happen very easily. And people will be deceived. And coming back to Max Tegmark, after he's describing this futuristic scenario with Prometheus, 
He then says, are we really in an unavoidable battle with an AI monster to stay alive? Listen to much of the debate and you could be forgiven for thinking so. A monster? And that brings me directly to the biblical scenario for the future. A series of monsters. And using wild beasts as symbols of totalitarian governments is something that we meet in Scripture, both Old Testament and New. The book of Daniel is famous for it. But let me read to you Revelation 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? It's a Prometheus like Tegmarks. And then there was another, a wild monster from the earth. I saw another beast, two horns like a lamb, speaking like a dragon. And what did it do? It deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all to be marked in the right hand so that no one can buy or sell unless he is the mark that is the name of the beast of the number of its name. That's almost identical to the Prometheus project of Tegmar. Now, when you see that, a question arises, what is this? Is this scripture telling us that there's going to be an artificial general intelligence like the Omega monster? Or is it something even more sinister because it is an artifact, it's a construct, they make the image, but then it's given breath. How far is God going to allow people to go? On the other hand, people may be racked and say, but look, this is imagery. This is symbolism. Goodness me, all these beasts with multiple heads and horns and all this kind of thing. It's symbolism and metaphor. Of course it is. But if you've read a lot of C.S. Lewis like I've done, you'll not make the mistake of thinking that because there are symbols, there's no underlying reality. And Lewis made very clear in his writings that symbols and metaphors always describe a reality. And what is the reality? Well, the theologians among you will know instantly that what is described in symbolic language in Daniel and the book of Revelation is described in plain, down-to-earth text by Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians. Listen to it. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, homo deus. And then, says Paul, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and deception. That's straightforward language. And Paul actually told this to people who had only been Christian for three weeks. And he reminded them I wonder, do you teach this to young Christians in your church? Why did he do it? Why talk about the future to three-week-old Christians? Because, as he said, the mystery of this lawlessness, it is lawlessness, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, in the sense of spiritual lawlessness, a man claiming to be God and ruling the earth with a rod of iron, of course. It's not civil lawlessness. Why did he say it then? Because it was already operating in their society. He told them so. The Caesars were claiming to be God, some of them before their death, most of them after their death. And Christians were being persecuted, tortured, and killed because they wouldn't bow down and acknowledge 
the power and the authority of the Caesar who is God. I find this fascinating that 20 centuries ago there's a scenario that people are bringing to scientists, leading thinkers. And my argument is simple, which is why I wrote my book. It's just this. If you're going to take seriously Tegmark and his scenario, I would like to introduce you to a scenario that's got far more credibility because of the actual arguments for its truth than Tegmark's. And I find that people do. But now I'm coming to a crunch here. The AGI project, the Homo Deus project, is flawed. Now, why is it flawed? Well, Harari wants to solve the problem of physical death. He also wants to upgrade humanity. But there's another person with a completely different agenda. When people talk to me, about Harari's hopes, I say, you're too late. <laughs> the problem of physical death was solved 20 centuries ago when God raised Christ from the dead. And as for upgrading humanity, what a marvelous upgrade that Jesus Christ has done. First, it's in two stages, of course. Because when we encounter Christ and face the mess we've made of our own lives and sadly sometimes the lives of others and trust of a Savior and Lord, we receive new life. It's eternal life. And that is true in several senses. It's the very life of God, so it will exist eternally. And it guarantees for the person that trusts the Lord Jesus, that they will be raised from the dead. That is by far the biggest upload I've ever read of. <laughs> to as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God. And phase two, it's worth reading this, isn't it? After all this gloomy stuff, just listen to this. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. This mortal must put on immortality. You see, the true Homo Deus will return from heaven. As he stood before his judges, you shall see, he said, the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. And privately to his disciples, in Acts 1, they were told this same Jesus shall so come as you saw him go. They saw him go literally and physically until a cloud received him out of their sight. He shall come literally and visibly. So we've got the contrast between Harari's vision and the vision of Jesus Christ, and the contrast is huge. Let's take these two worldviews as we come to a conclusion. John Gray is a professor of the history of European thought, an atheist, well worth reading usually. Humans may well use science to turn themselves into something like gods as they have imagined them to be, but no supreme being will appear on the scene. Instead, there will be many different gods, each of them a parody of human beings that once existed. I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And if we're going to understand what's going on, we need to take a worldview perspective. My late teacher of quantum mechanics was Professor Sir John Polkinghorne in Cambridge. 
And he wrote, if we are to understand the nature of reality, we have only two possible starting points, either the brute fact of the physical world or the brute fact of a divine will and purpose behind that physical world. And the difference between those two worldviews is colossal. Sean Carroll, physicist, we humans are blobs of organized mud which through the impersonal workings of nature's patterns have developed the capacity to contemplate and cherish and engage with intimidating complexity of the world around us, the meaning we find in life is not transcendent. That's bottom-up reductionist atheism, but there's such a thing as top-down Christian theism. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God made humans in his own image. So there's a choice to be made. In transhumanism, humans become gods by trusting technology. Christianity is the exact opposite. God becomes human in Jesus Christ. And through trusting him, humans become children of God. Have you ever thought about this? Why? are humans, original model that God created so special. I'll tell you why. God became one. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what it means to be made in God's image. And the tragedy of many of these futuristic scenarios is the fatal flaw that they try to create utopia by bypassing the fundamental flaw in human beings, and that is sin. They have no cross. We have hope because there is a cross, and the Word who became flesh gave his life for us, and God raised him from the dead. That's what gives me hope. And at my age now, I want to try as best I can in the time left to really try to get across to my fellow Christians, but to the world in general, the fact, the central hope of Christianity, that Jesus Christ is actually going to return. Thank you very much indeed. (laughs) Professor John Lennox is not only the distinguished gentleman that was introduced, but he's also going to be the distinguished research fellow at the um, uh, Lanier Theological Library and Learning Center in Yarnton Manor. So you've got every (laughs) excuse to go over there. Thank you very much. Okay, there are a boatload of questions, and we'll just have to get through them as best as we can. If absolute truth were established and agreed upon, would we need to fear AI as much? We live in a fallen world, and absolute truth is not going to be agreed. The whole problem with our world is a rebellion against God, and we are called upon to witness to the one who is truth. And it's a hypothetical question, and I think looking at the world with all the thousands of years of education, the world's in a bigger mess than it's ever been. So I don't think we're gonna have to face that one, but what we should do is deepen our conviction that when Jesus Christ said, I am the truth, he wasn't merely saying, I say the truth. He's the ultimate answer to every question. What's the truth about the universe? Well, there are galaxies and planets and stars. What's the truth about them? Well, they're made of chemicals and atoms and molecules. What's the truth about them? Those questions do not go back forever. Ultimately, you're going to find Christ standing behind them and saying, I'm the truth. That's a huge claim. Um, There are a couple of questions here that 
fall into the same category. It's, it's a category of concern that I've got. So I'm going to start by framing my question yeah. and then we'll, we'll work through a couple of permutations of that here. Uh, I, I have read uh, a number of people say we need to get a six month moratorium on developing AI. We need to come up with these ethical guidelines for AI. We need to come up with ways we can um, uh, agree that we will use AI, ways we will limit AI. And I'm all for the idea of getting control and keeping control of AI, but I have a concern that there are people in the world who will not stop nefarious development of AI and we put a, a hold on what we're doing for six months or we hedge what we're doing in with guardrails of, of certain protections and meanwhile there's a government in North Korea that's going to do everything they can to circumvent all of that. They leapfrog us because all of a sudden we're six months behind or there are um, people worth bazillions of dollars who are developing this in order to basically become that evil ruler that we've seen in all the James Bond movies. Um, do you have a concern about how we try to navigate in waters where there are some sharks swimming in the water? I have huge concern for, uh, for the same reason as you have. Point number one, Vladimir Putin said a few years ago, the state that controls AI will control the world. That's number one. Number two, ethics in general, because God has been rejected, particularly in the West, is an ethical view called preference utilitarianism. Utilitarianism, simply put, is the idea that you should always base your ethics on the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people. Now that's flawed. Hitler thought that the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people was to eliminate the Jews. So that's a huge problem. But utilitarianism works if you're dividing ice cream among children. If you want to keep the kids happy, you have to divide it exactly equally among the kids. Now the problem that underlies what you're saying, and I don't see an easy answer to this, that utilitarianism works if you've got a world consisting of a number of roughly equal centers of power. So suppose you're in control of one of them and I'm in control of the other. We set up ethics and I say, well, if you do this, I'll do that. And that kind of tit for tat analysis which leads to agreements and treaties sounds wonderful. But if you go back to Hitler, when he was a political infant, he made treaties. But once he got the power, he didn't bother. Because you see, if I get enough power, and you say to me, well look, if you do this, I'll do, you'll do what? I've got the power. And that's exactly the problem you're expressing. And I don't know any easy answer to it. I think it's very important though, to realize that we're not in a total moral vacuum, even in situations where God has been rejected. Why do I believe that? Lewis, in his book, The Abolition of Man, has a, an appendix at the end that's well worth reading. And he researched all, well, 20 or 30, 40 philosophies, religions all around the world, and he discovered that they all had a common moral base. And in particular, he discovered that every single one of them, including Roman pagan religion, humanism, Christianity, and so on, had a version of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would be done by. Now, that tells me, as a Christian, that Paul in Romans indicates in modern terminology that human beings are all hardwired with a built-in morality. They've got some moral compass. And if that weren't there, the whole of humanity would just fall apart instantly. So we can at least work with that. But because we have the ability to rebel against our inner moral convictions, 
you face this huge difficulty. So I'm torn in two directions. One, yes, let's work. Let's have the best lawyers in the world, like yourself, to write these rules. And people are trying to do it, and to at least save us from something. But let's realize that rules are not enough. Every business executive I've ever talked to tells me it's one thing to put the moral and ethical mission statement on the wall in the boardroom, it's another one to get it into the hearts of the executives. So there's a lot of work, but this is why finally we need to have Christian believers working in this area. There are some wonderful examples. Ros Pickard of MIT with her AI lab, a whole discipline invented by herself, that smartwatch that can recognize if a child or an adult is about to have a seizure and save its life. That, that's wonderful stuff to be working on. There are many positive things. We need people in there with scientific qualifications, but who are ethically strong. And of course, it's the old problem. Socrates thought that education was enough to make people ethical. But Aristotle realized the ethics were fine, but he hadn't the power to do it. And that's where the gospel comes in, because the gospel doesn't simply give us ethics, as you know. It gives us the power to live and a transformation, and we need to be emphasizing that. One of the most popular books of the Renaissance era was The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. Yes. And in chapter eight, and, and he's writing to um, instruct a de Medici young man who's going to become the ruler. And he's telling him how to be a good ruler. And in chapter 18, he says, you're going to rule with vice. Lie when you need to lie. Go back on your word when you need to go back on your word. No good <coughs> ruler rules virtual, virtuously. But you must appear to be virtuous, especially religious, so that people won't question you while you do these vices. So I take it the next step with this next question. Friends of mine who endorse transhumanism seem to take it for granted that smarter people will make good decisions. What are the odds that transhumanism can overcome sinfully poor decision makers? What are the odds? Zero. <laughs> As you were speaking this, this evening, I was reminded of uh, Thomas Malthus, yeah. an economist in the late 1800s who determined that we would run out of food to feed the mm -hmm. masses. And he postulated that you really need to let people starve to death because if we try to feed the needy, they'll just keep breeding and there'll be more needy people. So actually utilitarian wise, he said, everyone you kill today will spare 10 from dying in the future. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that led to the eugenics program all around the world. And you see what's happened with it. Now we have it dressed up in Oxford as oddly effective altruism and long-termism, it is absolutely incredible. But we've now got the technology to do things we could never do before. And that's frightening, because the Germans tried this, and they tried to create an Ubermensch, as you know, Nietzsche. The Russians tried to do it, create the new man. And as I think I said on another occasion, I'll never forget, uh, a member of the Academy of Sciences in Siberia saying to me, John, you know, we thought we could get rid of God and retain a value for human beings. We discovered too late we couldn't. Uh, what would be your advice to Christians considering careers in artificial intelligence? Consider them very carefully and go into something. You see, they're most likely to be offered career in narrow AI. And there you can make ethical decisions because you're not likely to go into something that is doing something that you know is morally illegal. There are huge fields 
of narrow AI in medicine particularly, but not only there, that are doing an awful lot of good. Or if you're an ethicist, you can go in and contribute there. And uh, that's uh, very, very important indeed. I mean, you have at this weekend, Gretchen Heusinger, who's working on that very thing, and her work is very important, and others like her. Uh, Gretchen, where are you? There, there you are. Would you stand up so people know you, who you are, because they may want to accost you with <laughs> questions afterwards. Um, some of these questions uh, I, I chuckle at, and I'm not going to read. <laughs> so the one that says, what is your cell number? I would like you to be my mentor. I will not read. You mean my cell number in uh, prison? <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a related question uh, that to what we were just saying. What advice would you give to high school students in this day and age? I always say to high school students to play to their strengths first of all. And at any stage in life, ask yourself, what can I do now to maximize my potential for the future? Now I notice a huge difference. As you heard, I'm very old. When I was young, I hadn't a notion, not a notion, of the kind of job opportunities that are available today. Not only university education, but apprenticeships and high-tech industry and all this kind of thing. And what is marvelous, and I'm sure they exist in your schools, career advisors who, who really know about these possibilities. If you're a believer, a Christian believer, then there's an extra question to ask. How can I so serve God in my work that I can maximize my witness? And I've got a long answer to the question. And you yourself, sir, have been very kind in endorsing my latest book, which is called A Good Return. You want to get a good return on your investment of life? I endorsed it because it was a good book. Well, there we are. It's called <laughs> Biblical Principles of Work, Wealth, and Wisdom, and it's already available. And that, I'm encouraged to say, many young people have found it helpful. But, you know, talk to people, find out what their jobs are like, and inform yourself early. And if you want to go to university, go and visit the department, talk to the people, because universities like people who are actually interested. So there are lots of little practical tips that you can follow. All right, how is, um, hold on. Do you believe that AI can develop a mind? Well, since we don't know what a mind is, and we don't know what consciousness is, I certainly believe it can simulate some of what the human mind does. But you see, we're talking about a machine. And machines at the theoretical level, all of them, past, present, or future, can be simulated by what's called a Turing machine. It's, it's a mathematical object. And this is the subject of a very brilliant piece of mathematics called the Church-Turing thesis. And I tend to be sympathetic with Roger Penrose's arguments in his book. He's a brilliant mathematician that used to work with Stephen Hawking, that there are certain things that the human mind can do that are not algorithmic. So they will be never, you can never put them into a machine. And I think there's a gap there. But since we haven't a notion of what consciousness is, and minds as we understand them are conscious, then I, I, I think it's hard to even make sense of what the question would mean. Um, so what are your thoughts on the sightings in many countries of UFOs from another universe, wormhole? Well, I, I believe they are what they say. They're unidentified, so we don't know what they are. <laughs> Do
Do you view it against God's will to modify human genes that remove the imperfections that sin caused in the first place? Well, there's an assumption there that by modifying the genes, we will do that. I think I take very seriously what I said in the last few minutes, that humans are so amazing that God could become one. That is utterly awesome. You know, the heavens declare the glory of God. They weren't made in his image, you were. And therefore, to take God's specification and to do something that's going to re-engineer it, I think comes under Lewis's criticism that what you now produce is not a human being, but an artifact. It's subhuman. Uh, and therefore, trying to do that is uh, essentially rebellion against God. And that's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I'm sorry. Beta oh, minus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do you view the soul in all of this? The soul's a complex thing because looking at scripture, the word psuche, from which we get psychology, which is usually used for soul, has that spectrum of meanings. I, I've always found this theologically fascinating, that the big words have a spectrum of meanings. So a soul, the soul can stand for the whole person. In Noah's Ark, eight souls were saved, not some disembodied spirit, but eight people. Or John can write to a lady and said, I hope you're well, even as your soul is well. So he makes a distinction. And I've thought about this, and I've asked myself, so what? What are we meant to learn from Scripture about the soul? And Peter comes to our help, because he is the only one that talks to us about the salvation of the soul. And that is a concept that the Lord taught him. And I used to learn it as a child, and I couldn't understand it, because I was told, you've a soul to be saved, and if you want to save it, you should lose it. And then I lost it at that point. I couldn't understand what that meant. But thinking of it in its context as an adult, I think it's very powerful. You see, the soul, one meaning of it, seems to me to be life in the sense of what makes life, life. And when Peter resisted the Lord, when he was predicting that he was going to die on the cross, that'll never happen to you. It was in that context that Jesus taught him what the salvation of the soul meant. Peter had spent three years investing his life, his time, his energy, his money in Christ. And now Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and be rejected. Peter thought he was losing his soul, his life. Life was being drained out. And Jesus said, look, you think you're losing it. But if you invest it for me and my kingdom, you're going to save it. So the practical meaning of the soul for me, and I'm sure it was not perhaps behind the original question, but I find it a thrilling thing that we can invest life in Christ and we'll never lose any of it. Now, you see, here's a practical example. You've invested how long? Nearly an hour and a half. Wasting your time coming to this meeting in the opinion of thousands of people in Houston. Who would waste the time when they could be watching a ball game, for goodness sake? They think you're wasting your life, but it's an investment for eternity. That's what I think it means. And that means something to me. And that's something that AI will never have. It looks like it, but it might help me to invest my life properly. Because if it saves me time when I go to get an x-ray and I get cured faster and gives me a few more years to serve the Lord, then, you know. It's a good thing. Yes, exactly. Would you join me in thanking John Lennon?